Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Anyway, welcome to Freestyle Friday where you can do what I want. Time for more how the sausage or wine is made videos. No BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm going to strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the trick is made, how the magic trick is made. Not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone. This is just reality. All right, so I just spent last week talking about conventional farming. What I didn't cover is the typical wine that comes from conventional farming. The answer is that any and all styles of types of wine come from this. Conventional farming is the most widely practiced method in the world for agriculture, and this applies to vineyards as well. So the vast majority of wine is made from conventionally farmed grapes. Repeating what I said a couple weeks ago, using 2018 numbers, only 5.7% of the vineyards in the world were certified organic. For certified biodynamic in 2020, the total is 0.3% of total vineyards. So yes, conventionally farmed vineyards make up around 94%, give or take a percent, in today's number. Now, total vineyard acreage has been trending downward, so current numbers may be closer to 93% for conventional farming. While organic and biodynamic vineyards are on the rise, they are still a small percentage of the total acreage. Some countries have higher percentages of organic and biodynamic vineyards than others. This is typically dependent on the climate of their wine growing areas. Areas with less disease pressure and access to water are the easiest to farm this way. So when it comes to wine, most of the wine produced comes from conventionally farmed grapes, but how is the wine made? Well, I could easily put out a ton of episodes that give some pretty detailed info on the typical winemaking process. I'll need to give you more of an overview in this episode. I do plan on having some detailed episodes on just some specific aspects of winemaking after I finish this series of shows. So in general, most wine is made in such a way as to ensure it meets the quality and profitability goals of the winery. You can make the best wine in the world, sparing no expense, but the cost may be so high that you end up losing money on the wine. It could also be the most average of wines, or not even very good, but garner a huge profit percentage. You just need to sell millions of bottles of it. I alluded to this in my series of shows quite a few weeks ago on the cost of wine. There are a couple paths grapes make depending on if the wine will be red, white, or rosé in addition to still, fortified, dessert, sparkling, etc. I'm going to concentrate on still wines and skip a step or two just to keep things moving along. Let's start with the grapes arriving in the winery. Grapes are destemmed, crushed, and pressed. For that under $20 bottle of wine, this will be done mechanically. Once this happens, the juice is fermented. This is usually the first step where we can see a difference in conventional, organic, or biodynamic wine. I'll cover the last two over the next few weeks, uh, so I'll stick with conventional here. For fermentation, a winery is going to almost always use commercially available yeast. Yeast is the dirty little secret when it comes to winemaking. I don't literally mean dirty, just that it's often ignored as to how important a yeast strain can be to the final outcome of a wine. Thousands of strains are out there. Many are designed to be used with specific grape varieties. And I don't mean, well, there are some GMO yeast, but they're also bred to be a certain way. Within that, you can have strains that give you specific outcomes. You can dial in specific flavors and aromas. It's not like you can make a Chardonnay taste like Cabernet Sauvignon, but you can emphasize certain grape characteristics. The cheaper the wine, the cheaper the ingredients, and the perceived taste. So with yeast, you can make sure that the wine at least tastes like it's supposed to. However, I typically find a generic flavor to value wines. Those wines are under $10. As you go up in price, these wines tend to taste more like they're supposed to or have more varietal character. Much of this is the quality of the grapes themselves, but yeast can be used to adjust this to make lower quality grapes taste closer to higher quality grapes. Most of the time, the temperature of the fermentation is controlled. Yeast have a 
Goldilocks zone. Too hot, they die. Too cold, they go to sleep. In the middle, they happily eat the sugar and poop out alcohol and CO2, along with getting all hot. So temperature control helps keep the must in that zone. That's what is called grape must. Yeast normally dies around 15% alcohol. Some die at lower levels, and some can survive as much as high as 17%. Those wines that are higher are fortified with grape spirit or brandy. This comes into play in what the final alcohol versus sugar ratio is. Your mass-produced wine won't really mess with this too much. If they, they want to have a higher RS or residual sugar level, then they can stop fermentation a couple ways. Well, how do they stop it? Well, you can drop the temperature low enough to stop fermentation. You can also assist in this process by adding SO2. Too much SO2 during this process will create a wine fault, so you have to be careful with this. Adding grape spirit to get the wine over 17% can be done, but that's not really done for a regular wine. Once fermentation stops, the wine is filtered so that all the yeast is removed. If a wine is left to fully ferment, then the yeast naturally die, and then the wine is removed from the fermentation vessel. In most cases, this is a stainless steel tank. During fermentation, the wine is constantly being tasted and analyzed to make sure everything's proceeding normally. Nutrients are the most common thing added to the fermenting must and can be added to ensure fermentation starts or doesn't get stuck. Also, during primary fermentation and after it is done, a few things will happen to the wine. The winemaker will see what the chemistry of the wine is, the ABV, the TA, VA, pH, etc. In conjunction with tasting the wine, the winemaker will see if these numbers are in line with their goal. Each of these can be adjusted through various methods. Acid adjustments are one of the most common around the world. Acid and pH are related, and a good number is essential to prevent bad things from happening to the wine. Once the winemaker is happy with how primary fermentation happens, then a secondary fermentation happens called malolactic fermentation. Instead of yeast controlling this, a bacteria does the work. Almost all reds go through this. White wines, not always. It depends on the desired style of the wine. For our purposes, we'll assume the wine goes through malolactic, aka mallow, ML, or MLF. Mallow can happen simultaneously as primary fermentation, but it usually happens right after primary ends or is slowing down. Similar to primary fermentation, temperature, bacteria strain, and other factors will ensure a good malolactic conversion. The purpose of the secondary fermentation is to convert lactic acid to malic acid, a stronger acid to a weaker acid, at least how we perceive it on the palate. Otherwise, the wine could be perceived as too tart. Much of the time, ML will proceed naturally. However, it sometimes needs to be encouraged. For that under $20 bottle of wine, it's almost always going to be tightly controlled to ensure it happens and doesn't get stuck. Throughout these fermentations, oxygen level is closely monitored. Oxygen is both friend and foe throughout the entire winemaking process, so the winemaker needs to be conscious of the oxygen level at all times. With ML done normally, the wine rests. This allows for a lot of solids from fermentation to settle to the bottom. Primary fermentation creates something called lees. We'll skip what that is and how it affects wine for now. During this resting period, a variety of substances are often used to fine a wine. This is a coarse filtering of the wine. The way it works is that something is added to the wine that has an opposite magnetic charge to the charge of the large particles that are in the wine. As the additive drops through the wine, it collects these larger particles and drags them to the bottom. Here's the list of fining or clarifying agents allowed in the US and actually much of the rest of the wine world. Okay, you ready? Acacia gum, albu albumin or egg white, activated carbon, aluminosilicates, aka bentonite, calcium carbonate or limestone, casein or milk protein, catalase, an enzyme found in bacteria, plants, and animals. It also decomposes hydrogen peroxide and used in many products. Cellulase, another enzyme also used in many products. Glucose oxidase, a catalyst used in food preservation. Pectinase, an enzyme mostly used in the production of juice. Ferrous sulfate, a kind of iron salt used mostly in medications. Isinglass, or fish bladder. Milk, all right, this is a fun one. Polyvinyl polypyrrolidone, or PVPP. Silica gel, and then tannin. A lot of these won't be familiar to anyone except the winemaker. 
even for us industry people, the most common or at least the most talked about are albumin or egg white, aluminosilicates, aka bentonite, that, that, does, that sounds bad, but it's not, casein or limestone, isinglass or fish bladder, milk and PVPP. The rest really never come up in conversation. I don't know how much they are actually used, but the TTB or the FDA allow it for most winemaking, allow it for winemaking. Most of these can also be used in regular juice production so that you can have that nice clear fruit juice. Some are used in cider, as in hard cider production. They all have some kind of maximum amount allowed, sometimes a specific number, other times the note says GRAS or generally recognized as safe. This list is one of the main sources of those companies that are marketing healthier or more natural wines to you by using scare tactics. They'll put something along the lines of the FDA or government allows the use of X number of additives to wine. The number varies depending on what uh, they include in the list, but the list I used has 63. I'll have a link to it titled Materials Authorized for the Treatment of Wine and Juice in the description below. There are a couple other lists. One is for all organic products. The other one partially duplicates the first list and also adds in some winemaking processes we'll talk about soon. So we've find the wine, what else will happen? Cold stabilization will often happen for white wines. This is to prevent those wine diamonds from forming in a wine, or at least be visible in a white wine. These are crystals of tartaric acid precipitating out of solution, completely harmless, but can be alarming for the wine drinker that doesn't know what it is. At this point, wines destined for aging will be put into some kind of aging vessel. We most commonly think of this as the standard oak barrel, what we see in a cellar, but there are some creative ways to do this and also impart those oaky flavors to a wine. Wines that aren't going to be aged will go to a holding tank for a period of time instead of aging. These are almost always the same kind of tanks used for fermentation or stainless steel. Next is bottling. Wines that are aged in a barrel will get moved to another tank to make the bottling easier. During the bottling process, filtration will most likely occur. While some winemakers will not filter their wines, they are in the minority. Filtration helps finish the wine. It can remove those finer particles that may make the wine unpleasant to drink or make it cloudy. It can also remove any remaining yeast that may have stayed dormant till the end. Additionally, it can remove bacteria. It all depends on how small the filtration is, usually measured in microns. This is important to prevent another fermentation or spoilage from happening in the bottle. This is the reason the old school still wines from Champagne had so many issues. The wine was stored in a cold cellar in the winter because fermentation had stopped. Then they bottled it during that time. In the springtime, the weather got warmer and the now bottled wine had dormant yeast wake up. Pressure built up in the bottle and you had the potential of wine bombs. At the time, no one knew what yeast was. They just thought it was some magical process that created wine. Eventually, the winemakers there started realizing what was going on and that this sparkling wine might be a thing, so they started intentionally making it. In most other parts of the world, fermentation finished before it got too cold, so these exploding bottles weren't a problem. Also, the act of bottling a wine at the winery is a relatively recent thing. It's really only been common for about 100 years. Before that, wine stayed in a barrel and then was shipped to a merchant. That barrel might go to a tavern or to be tapped, or that merchant might bottle it to sell to bars, restaurants, and general public. At this point, it's all a matter of time before you get that bottle off the shelf at the wine shop or at your table in a restaurant. But there's more to the story. I skipped over a lot of things that can be done to adjust, correct, or manipulate that wine. Remember that list of additives or processing aids? Well, there are a few things on it that may surprise you. Oak chips or particles. Now the list says uncharred and untreated, so I don't know if a toast, what they call it, is considered uncharred or not. I can tell you that various toast levels of oak chips and powder are readily available to be used. Where are these used? Well, instead of the wine going into a barrel, it goes into a tank, usually a stainless steel tank, and these oak alternatives are added to the wine for several days to a few weeks. Just long enough to impart flavor. You can also have special tanks that will have oak staves inside them. These can even be stainless steel barrels with these staves in them. These staves can be swapped out uh, each year if necessary. Oak alternatives are there just to give you that oaky flavor and aroma. 
A real oak barrel also allows a small amount of oxygen to get into the wine in addition to those flavors associated with oak. If you're drinking a, a wine for under 20 bucks, it almost certainly didn't spend any time in new oak barrel. Or if it did, it was a very small amount of new oak. That oaky flavor came from an alternative. I can almost guarantee that. Over 20 bucks, and you might have a small percentage of real oak and maybe some oak alternatives. A lot of this does depend on the overall cost of making the wine. So in parts of the world where it's not so expensive, you might see a $15 or an $18 bottle retail wine having like 20 or 30% new oak. A lot of times these under $20 bottles of wine, like for the United States, won't mention any oak. You might see something like from South America, Portugal, Spain, even parts of Italy, you might see oak mentioned and it's like a $20 bottle of wine. But in general, the less expensive the wine, the less likely you have actual real oak barrels. All right, so just to add to this, not all wine, red, white, or rosé, has to have an oaky flavor. Whites and rosés are the, are the ones that will most commonly not see any oak, but reds can do that too. It's sometimes the regional style, not tied to cost cutting. While the wine is sitting in one of these tanks, the winemaker can replicate the oxidation that a barrel brings. It's called micro-oxygenation, or microx. It can be done in a traditional barrel too. Michel Roland is considered the one who popularized it. However, how he is depicted in the movie Mondo Vino may not be entirely in the up and up. In an article by Jancis Robinson, she asked him about this, about the movie. According to him, the movie repeated two instances of him telling numerous Bordeaux winemakers to use it. He tells Jancis he's really not actually a fan of Microx. Nevertheless, it is associated with him. Anyway, Roland advises that it only be used between primary and secondary fermentation. However, it can be used after secondary. It introduces small amounts of oxygen in very tiny bubbles for a short period of time. The introduction of small amounts of oxygen, whether in tanks or traditionally from a barrel, helps soften the wine and enhance flavors and aromas. Microx just speeds up the process of oxygenation so you don't have to go through the expense of using barrels. I've actually seen one of these in person at Yano Sakata in Lubbock, Texas. It's amazing in the sense of as to what it does for a wine. As far as what it looks like, you'd never know unless you knew what to look for. I have a feeling that I've passed by one of these things a few times in my travels, but the winemaker chose to ignore it. It can be used for wines at any price point. I don't have any evidence to point to, but it's highly likely using in conjunction with oak alternatives in your under $20 bottle of wine. It's common in Bordeaux and as many as 11 other countries, especially in large wineries. Yeast is also on the list of as an additive. Okay, kind of weird since that's what ferments the wine. It's there to differentiate it from native yeast. Native yeast is super old school winemaking. Yeast wasn't known about until 1857 when Louis Pasteur figured out what was creating fermentation. At some point, winemakers, brewers, and distillers, along with bakers, were able to create their own yeast to use. Then it became commercialized, evolving to what we have today. A wide variety of choices that can suit any kind of wine you want to make. The winemaker can also adjust the pH or acid levels in the wine. Not an uncommon practice around the world. This is done for a couple reasons. One of the most important is to prevent spoilage, or an environment where bacteria can grow and create faults in a wine. It also acts as a preservative to allow wines to age longer in slow oxidation. This is a big reason why many white wines can age for decades, talking about acid. They lack the phenolic compounds like tannin to allow long-term aging. Tannin is a natural antioxidant along with other polyphenols found in red wine. In dessert wines or just sweet wines, it's the combination of sugar and acid that allow aging. The winemaker can use additives from that list to either increase or decrease the acidity and therefore the pH of the wine. Ideally, you don't do this, but in a lot of places in the world, the grapes don't retain enough acid to keep them fresh tasting. So this acid adjustment isn't really done for aging potential, it's to make the wine taste better. This kind of adjustment happens at any price point. Then we have the bane of all winemaking, Mega Purple and its cousins, Mega Cherry Shade and Mega Red. If there's a true dirty little secret, it's this. Mega Purple is concentrated grape juice made from one of the few red grapes that actually has red juice, called Ruby Red. Almost all grapes have clear juice. 
Ruby Red is a cross between Alicante Ganzen and Tita Kaum. Both are regular wine grapes. Alicante Ganzen is another uh, tinterior grape like Ruby Red, a grape with red juice. We get the wine color for red and rosé wine from grape skins. The general public associates depth of color with the quality of a wine. So winemakers will use a few techniques to improve the color of their wine. Some wines will have what is called extended maceration. This is where the grape skins stay in the juice after pressing. This has to happen to get a red or rosé color, but leaving the grape skins in contact for longer than normal means a deeper color. The downside can be more tannic or bitter wine, but we can mostly fix that later. The majority of red wines under 20 bucks will all have this in it. Not all of them, but most of them, and almost no one will admit to using it. But get this, it's a somewhat open secret that more expensive wines also use Mega Purple, or let's just say that those of us in the industry assume that some of these higher priced wines use it. Like wines over 50 bucks. I'm not saying names because I don't know for sure. So the, 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 the thing is, there are people out there that are gonna use it and they will absolutely deny they're using it. They're just not gonna say they're using it. And like I said, a little bit goes a long way. 0.2% can really add some color to your wine. Any of these techniques are used commonly. The most disturbing is when you have a Pinot Noir from say, I don't know, California that is opaque. Pinot Noir, no uncertain terms, should be opaque. It needs to be translucent, almost see-through. It's a thin skinned grape, so the color should be light. But because of that misconception of color equals quality, some of the most popular Pinot Noirs from Cali most certainly use at least one of these techniques to create a deep red color. And they'll never admit it in public or even in private. The winemaker can also fine tune the final alcohol level. This is most often accomplished with reverse osmosis. Legally, it's to reduce the final alcohol of the wine. The reason for this is that even an adjustment of 0.1% can change the perception of the wine. There is a sweet spot, so to speak, where a wine's taste will improve at certain ABVs. And the winemaker may want to reduce that ABV, but just keep those juicy ripe flavors. I know it's done, but I can't be for certain what the likelihood is. One clue is to see a wine under 14 or 13.5% alcohol, <clears throat> but the grapes come from a region known for never having an issue getting ripe grapes. We're talking like, we're talking like hot climates, not talking like marginal climates. 13.5% is actually pretty common. Lower the ABV, uh, lowering the ABV can bring back balance to the wine. So yeah, as much as a winery or winemaker might imply that all they do is stomp some grapes and let the juice naturally ferment, and then just bottle that delicious goodness, the reality is that effectively all wine goes through a more complicated process to get from grape juice to adult grape juice. All this is done for the sake of providing balance to wine, improving flavor, aromas, and mouthfeel, achieving a pleasing color. A wine that doesn't sell doesn't make anyone any money. When you see it on a shelf or in a restaurant, everyone already got paid. Well, except for the retailer of the restaurant. But if a winery keeps making poor wine, then no one farther down the supply chain will buy their next vintage. Then we get to sulfites. I'll have an entire episode devoted to this. But the short version is that SO2 can be added to any point to the winemaking process. The most common time is to add it during bottling. The purpose is to prevent oxidation or spoilage of the wine during the winemaking process and once it gets to the shelf or your cellar. Sulfites do not give you a hangover. It really is the alcohol that does. There might be a couple other things, but it's not the sulfites. Does every winery do all of this? Some do. The cheaper the wine, the more likely they will do more of these techniques. More expensive wines also have these techniques at their disposal, but will limit which ones they use. Most countries allow most of these things. Some restrict these techniques depending on the source of the grapes. Mass production of any product requires you to streamline the process and ensure a certain level of flavor, taste, color, and quality that isn't economically viable for smaller wineries. Wine isn't immune to these manipulations. I didn't do this to burst your bubble when it comes to wine. It's still a wonderful product that brings joy around the world. It's just that this is a business at the end of the day. So all these companies that are touting their small production, dry farm, low sugar, low sulfite, low alcohol, low calorie uh, wines to you may or may not be engaging in some of these practices to achieve these results. Because many of these techniques can do exactly that. And they wouldn't be lying, not really. 
Some of these things aren't necessarily forbidden in organic or biodynamic either. There are a few exceptions here and there. For the most part, an organic or bio wine will avoid most, if not all, these practices. All right, next week we'll tackle organic farming. We'll dispel some myths about it and give it a reality check. For now, relax with your favorite glass of wine. My job with this series of episodes is to give you sound information so that you can make your own choice when it comes to wine. I hope you get value out of this episode. I'll continue to tackle each method more in depth and how that affects the winemaking. I just wanted a separate episode to give uh, people a better idea how conventional wine is made. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends. And until next time.